Okay, so actually, I wanted to go around first and just see why people chose to come here today, what they know about fascia and what they'd like to know about fascia, or why they'd like to know about fascia. Mm. You can go right. first. And say your name, too, and I'll forget yes. it, I promise. Yes. And um, I know that fascia is kind of beneath your epidermis, maybe. I'm not using it quite right, but it's underlying your skin, but it's above your musculature, maybe? <laughs> Anyhow, it's like a network, mm -hmm. and um, kind of holds everything together, I think, but it weakens as you age, and that's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I know about fascia? I'm here because um, I find the whole subject of um, structural integration interesting. I didn't know about fascia until maybe a year ago. And um, I know that it can get stuck and um, that sometimes it needs to be realigned and I'm, I'm just interested in the subject. And my name is Gail. Hi, my name is Gail too. Oh. <laughs> I, I know nothing technically about it. I, I'm here because of structural integration I think it's an important it's important skills to know about to keep healthy. And what do you know about it at this point? Not much. Okay. Other than skin large. But I don't know if it's technically part of the skin or whether it's a separate it's entity. Technically separate. So it's large too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and my name's Murray and I'm interested specifically because I'm having trouble with my left shoulder and hand for these mm -hmm. days. But I had read a book about a year ago called The Melt Method mm -hmm. that talks a lot about, um, written by somebody who was a body worker and wanted to come up with a method that people could do to themselves. And talks a lot about the connective tissue and all these things and how important they are. And so when I saw this, I thought it was kind of um, timely. So I'm going to drop that down, the note method. I haven't heard of that. <laughs> and I, I mean, I've had physical therapy for legs, for backs, for various things over the years, and always thought, you know, that there must be ways that you can learn to do some of these things for yourself, which is part of what she talks about in mm -hmm. the book. She talks about how a lot of things, like she was an athlete who was severely injured mm -hmm. and, or, and wasn't able to, to be an athlete anymore, but went through a lot of body work in order to get herself back and then started doing it professionally. And her, her clients would say, gosh, I wish I could, I feel so good when I leave here, I wish I could do this myself. <laughs> and so she developed a whole method using soft rollers and balls mm -hmm. on things that you can do to your, for yourself. And um, I know that when I've done like physical therapy, they always make me roll on a hard roller and it always hurt really bad. Yeah, I always wondered about that. <laughs> and I could never understand how is this supposed to help me when it really hurts. And her idea is if it hurts, you're, you're tensing up. And how can that be doing you any good? Mm -hmm. um, so when I saw the thing, it was kind of like, oh, I need this right now. I need to <laughs> learn more about this. OK. Well, that's good to hear. Oh, we have a signal. There we go. That's going to need to go there. So, fascia is the organ of form. This, um, if you think of the, I like to break it down into three, the body into three holistic systems or holistic networks. And I think of holistic networks as um, if you were to have everything else but that network disappear, you would have a very good three dimensional understanding of the body. If you just took bone, you got a skeleton, you have a a general idea of how things look, but you don't have a, a full three-dimensional view of the body. If you just took the skin, um, you'd have this really detailed, great, superficial view of the body, but you'd cut it open and you'd see nothing inside. Um, if you take the nervous system, where everywhere where the nerves go, you would see just about the entirety of the body um, represented, except for the inside of the heart, because there are no nerves directly in those empty spaces. Um, if you took the circulatory system, you'd have a very similar 
um, look, you wouldn't have the skin in that case because the circulatory system technically, if you just look at veins and arteries and such, technically stop right below the skin. Now, if you take a system I'm going to refer to as the fibrous net, which would include fascia, tendons, ligaments, and arguably bone, um, then you would have the, a third view of the body. Um, do any of you here are familiar with um, vata, pitta, kapha, or endomorph, ectomorph, and mesomorph? No, I've heard about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So endomorphic, mesomorphic, and ectomorphic um, are, would arguably correspond to these three networks. So an ectomorph is someone who's very cerebral. Um, that's nervous system. You've got that nervous energy. Circulatory system is the endomorph, very in their gut. Um, and the fibrous network is the mesomorph, the very muscle-bound, active, engaged in the world person. So, so they correspond embryologically as well. But I won't get too much into that right now. Um, I want to explain what I mean by fascia and, and where what I'm saying will be inaccurate if you were to look at it broader. Um, the connective tissue, a, a broader term, is any cell that lives in a matrix that it creates. So the blood helps cre the blood cells help create the blood that's surrounding it. So blood is technically a type of connective tissue. Um, the bone creates the bone cells that it's in, the, the matrix in which it's in. So that's a type of connective tissue. The um, tendons and ligaments um, through fibroblasts create collagen fiber, which is the network, part of the network that's surrounding it. And so does fascia. Now, the difference between tendon, ligament, and fascia is solely the amount of liquid and the orientation of the fibers. They're really the same material, and it's a man-made division. So you, get some, so you can get these tissues that scientists will argue over whether or not it's tendon or ligament, or fascia, or an avenoroses, which is a big sheet of fascia found on the top of your head, or the diamond of your low back, or the plantar fascia of your feet is technically the plantar avenoroses, which seems like it should be called plantar, plantar um, avenorositis. But, that's <laughs> but in any case, when I use the word fascia, it tends to include tendons and ligaments in it, um, and avenoroses. So when I describe fascia from here on out, it won't technically just be the fascia. It will be the other types of materials that can be secreted from the same type of cell. Um, so those are the three holistic networks. Next question is, how is your body like an orange? Um, I tend not to, I could bring in a, a chicken leg, but some people might get upset by looking at actual fascia. And it would be dead anyway, so it would have its own limitations. So if everyone can grab a citrus fruit that they like, <laughs> there's oranges, clementines, and grapefruit. You good with your clementine? OK. So if you peel the orange really messily, like I just did, um, and you look directly under the skin, you see this white fibrous material. This is we're going to use as an analogy of the fascia. Um, so it's directly under the skin, which is the part of the fascia that you were describing, which coats the entire inside of the skin. And then you have this little sticky outy bit, which is similar to a septa, which comes down and is also continuous with it. Now, as you peel your orange, you'll see white surrounding each wedge. I did not pick a good orange for an example of this. <laughs> I'm hoping your guys are better. Grapefruits are probably pretty good for this. <laughs> so you'll see the white film is continuous with the orange wedges underneath it. And if you were to peel apart the, the orange itself, I'm going to point to this as an example here, it's continuous with every break is, is separated with this material. And if you get an individual wedge and you look at the wedge, you'll see that every um, fiber, every grouping of cells within the orange is also separated by a white material. And oh, those are good oranges. Um, <laughs> um, so fascia 
wraps all of the organs. <laughs> it wraps sort of the outside of right underneath the skin, so it's kind of like a leotard or unitard for the body. You can help yourself to a citrus fruit here. <laughs> Get you a napkin because they're a bit messy. Thank you. Sorry, I'm like no problem. It's just, I'm describing how fascia is like the white stuff inside an orange. <laughs> so, and then bundles of muscle fibers are wrapped in fascia. Whole mu individual muscles are wrapped in fascia. Muscle groups are wrapped in fascia. All the organs in your body are wrapped in fascia. It's the organ of space, fascia. So it's really holding everything together. It's just a big network. So this is a, some other images. This is a how the fascia is connecting in with um, a ligament. So it's continue as we were saying, the ligament is, for my case, description here is a type of fascia. But all of this is this, this is the skin above it sort of being peeled away. And you can see how we have this whole network. And it's all very fractal, all very geometric, but, but sort of randomly aligned. Um, and then the, then the other image shows you um, a still image of what I'll show you in a moment, which is there is a plastic surgeon who took a scope underneath the skin. And this is the only footage um, out there that shows fascia in a live body. If you look at it in, a, in an inert substance, it's, it, the, it lacks a certain quality. That on the right was real fascia. Yes. And Human fascia. Yes, and I believe in the arm. I believe it was a plastic surgeon that dealt with carpal tunnel stuff. So I'm going to just play a short, couple short clips from this, which are not as high definition as I thought they were. but. With rings that reinforce the solidity like an articulated bamboo stem, transparent sails, dew drops. Travel along these pearly structures and you notice the same fractal arrangement everywhere. Large fibrils endlessly punctuated by other smaller ones. The tissue continuum is total, the marriage homogeneous, and the arrangement completely fractal. A world of fibrillar chaos. The human body would seem to be one and the same tissue that has differentiated over time, but whose basic organization is stereotyped. Yet this organizational framework supporting life must have its inherent rules of behavior. How are these structures organized? How do they resolve and move and what so this is a, that was a clip from a, from a longer video, which I don't have the rights to show here. It's just their demo. Um, this is specifically myofascia. So this is the fascia around the muscle. Um, and it sure, sort of shows the classic medical textbook um, view of the different fascial layers as, are, are these distinct layers that wrap the fibers, like I was talking about, and then wrap the next bundle out. And this just shows how it's really not that cut and dry, that, was, that it's very much a simplification. We let it slide towards these opalescent short or long fibrils and blood vessels of varying forms in the areas surrounding the muscles. This is what we call the epimysium. Epimysial fibers are in continuity with the surface of the skin and blend into the hypodermis as we have already described in our previous film, The Skin Excursion. But they also enter, leave, mix with, combine, and penetrate deep into the perimysium, separating the bundles of muscular fibers. It seems obvious, apart from the sheer beauty, which is not negligible, that everything is connected. There is no break in continuity of living matter. There are no sheets of tissue, layers, or sublayers arising from nowhere. The epimysium and perimysium are continuous structures. As for the endomysium, which binds the muscle cells together, its finesse means that we can only guess at its presence during endoscopy. So all those different myceums she was describing were the different types of layers of fascia, different names for fascia given depending on where it is in the muscle. 
So fascia has been viewed as sort of disregarded by the medical community for quite a while, primarily because it was just the stuff that doctors got out of the way um, during med school so they could see what they were supposed to be studying. Um, same goes for fat, for that matter. Both of them were sort of like this messy stuff that we wish we didn't have. But when you look at it in context, you realize it's, its importance is a lot more than it's initially obvious. Um, any questions at this point about what you just saw at all? Or? So I've been describing up until now fascia as an organ of space, and that was the belief system up till a few years ago. Um, as I was saying, fascia is a under-researched tissue. Um, so they've only had like three or four international conferences on it. And during one of the conferences they had, it was discovered that fascia is, well, part of, one thing that was discovered is the type of body work I do, which I can talk more about later, um, is supposed to go in, the theory is, and sort of melt the, the tissue via thixotropy, like the same way you'd melt cold Play-Doh, heat and pressure, and sort of shape it where you want. What is supposed to? The fascia, the manipulation is a structural integration, and moving fascia around was supposed to, was described like that to me in school. Um, it turns out that it would require the weight of an elephant to be having the effects that we're seeing done in the body. Um, so it also turns out that fascia is 10 times more innervated, I think per square inch, than muscle is with sensory nerves. So most of our, the feelings in our body that we think of as muscular um, is actually the fascia, the, the network around it. Which makes sense when you think that the body likes to specialize, different types of cells specialize, and muscle fibers are really good at contracting. They're the motor, and have lots of motor neurons. They're really not designed to be sensory nerves for, for the sensory innervation the same way. So if, so it's sort of a question up in the air in some of the fossil community right now is, well, what are these structural integrators doing if they're not doing what they originally thought they were, which was with heat and pressure moving things around? It seems it probably has something to do with this, that there's some interface with the nervous system and that by contacting and stimulating the fascia, you're actually encouraging it to move different ways. So it's a lot more alive than the fascia that you just sort of <laughs> pull out of the dead corpse. Um, there's some basic principles of fascia that um, deal with sort of how do you be physically fit while keeping these principles in mind. Um, there, I'm going to talk a little bit about these consecrity models, which if you have one near you, you're welcome to play with or pass around. Um, I like to think of the body in terms of a tensegrity. You have tension structure holding it together. Tensegrity models are good for movement. Um, a building is stacked up, a stack of bricks. They don't move very well. They have to add steel struts to make so they can actually bend in the wind. So that's got some tension quality there. But if you're going to be actually getting up and walking around, you can't be just a compression structure. So I like this model. And this model means there's a couple of characteristics that it has. One is that if you have a compression anywhere in the structure, overall, the structure is compressed on average. If you have an expansion anywhere in the structure, overall the, stru the structure expands. And any restriction does affect the rest of the structure. And if you were to be pushing on this and trying to break it, the area that would break would be the, would be the weakest link. It wouldn't be necessarily the part you're pushing on. It would be whatever, whatever one of these bands it has the weakest tension to it. And, and that's what would break. And often would be the band that might be overstretched by the process of whatever that pushing is. Um, so there is a bouncy quality to a structure like this. If you've ever seen a child or a toddler fall, they bounce. And they have a nice, healthy fascial network. Um, as you, they also don't have much dexterity or control over their environment. Um, they're, they're toddling everywhere. So as you learn to walk and as you learn different behaviors, you start to lay, your body starts to lay down um, collagen fiber 
in the area in the way that you're moving. So form is following function. If you, um, I'll step away from that and talk about another connective tissue, bone, for a moment. Every time you put pressure on your body, your bone, the force of it on your bone creates what's called a piezoelectrical charge. It's essentially static electricity. And that um, discourages the growth of, um, of the osteoclasts, which are these little um, bone-eating cells. It discourages them from eating along that area of force. And then eats, it cleans up all the, the other potential heel spurs and bone spurs and such. Um, and by having, and it encourages the growth of the osteoblasts, the little baby bone cells that spew out lots of material. So over time, the way you use your bone changes the shape of your bone. That's why astronauts um, going into space need to have some sort of resisted activity or they get osteoporosis. And that's why weight-bearing exercise is useful for, um, for people as they age to be keeping their bone mass. Um, so fascia is similar, but it responds quicker. Um, bone, you get regenerates over a course of 70 years, you've got entirely new bone cells. Um, fascia is quicker, I don't have the numbers for you on that, but so how you use your fascia depends on how it grows. So, so if you do one type of activity over and over again, repetitive stress, you're laying down the fascia so you can do that activity really well. But as soon as you try to do another activity, you're going to have trouble doing it. So that's why an infant, the toddler that bounces and has all of these fairly loose and able to, um, able to really um, have a, an elasticity to everything, it will bounce well. But over time, if you were to be pushing this and, and, and deciding it needs a particular activity, then you're taking away versatility. So let's go through some of these. Let's hydration. When I talk about hydration, I'm not talking about how much water you drink. I'm talking about while you're doing physical activity, is that fluid getting to the fascia so it's not drying out? So when you first start a run or any sort of long act, um, physical activity, you might have that sort of a little joyful bounce to your step. And after about 10 minutes, something might start to cramp up or you might start to feel less joyful about the experience. Um, at that point, if you're trying to train healthy fascia, is a good time to stop running and walk. Now, it might be, there might be arguments as to why for muscle growth you should keep running or for cardiac health. I'm just going to talk about the benefits of fascial fitness. Um, so, if you, so if you were to um, let, walk for a little bit every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, you would have a chance to actually get that area to hydrate. So you won't be getting that cramp. Things won't be sort of drying up in a particular area. The ninja principle, um, I'm going to equate to this kangaroo here. The, um, there was a test done on kangaroos to figure out why they jump so high. And they determined that the, just the force of the muscle um, in their legs was not accounting for the height that they were getting the kangaroos. I've seen, this lab, I've seen some images of this lab. It's pretty bizarre to see a kangaroo on a treadmill. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, what it turns out is that their Achilles tendon um, running, I think, on the, here. Maybe it's here. I don't know. It's, I'm not familiar with kangaroo anatomy very well. Um, ha, is essentially a spring that's preloading. And so there's an elasticity that a kangaroo has to its Achilles tendon. Um, and fascia should have that nice elasticity to it in general. Um, if you, so you can train elasticity into your um, tendon if you go by the ninja principle, which is if you're going to do an exercise and, and jump into the air, see how quietly you can land. Because if you're landing quietly, the force isn't going into the floor. You're forcing your, um, your fascial system to absorb that force. If, you can, if you're going to run, run up or down a flight of stairs, um, do that as quietly as you can, running in place quietly. Anything that you can do where you're absorbing the, the force in your own body, that's not going to hurt you. So all these, be careful with everything. Um, it's going to help build the elasticity and train the elasticity in your system. 
dynamic stretching is if you wake up in the morning and you do a nice big yawn and a stretch, um, you're stretching in different directions at the same time. Your muscles are actively engaging. Um, it's a nice dynamic stretch. If you're simply reaching down to touch your toes and feeling a burn on the back of your legs, and um, it's not as dynamic of a stretch. You're actually not engaging the tissue as you're working with it. And when you do a stretch like this, you're not trying to see how far you can stretch. You're, it just kind of feels good. So any type of stretching you naturally see an animal do is actually usually pretty good for you. You're clearing up fascia that's sort of started to bind in different ways, and you're helping that. So the more sort of counter stretch you have, the more full body the stretch activity is without feeling too linear, the more likely it's a quality dynamic stretch. Pre-stressing movement is um, kind of like the kangaroo. You gotta, if you do a nice bend to your knees before you jump into the air, you're pre-stressing it. Um, oh, jump rope, by the way, for the ninja principle. Quietly, trying to do jump rope quietly trains that elasticity quite well. Um, the pre-stressing, oh, sorry, the, yeah, pre pre-stressing is the baseball player pulling back before they release. You're getting a nice full movement. If you're gonna lift something up, maybe lift something up, get underneath it ahead of time, maybe even exaggerate the knee bend and go down further before lifting up so you have a little bit of a pendulum effect. Any sort of pendulum swing will help the elasticity of the fascia, just swinging your arm or doing a full body. We'll see what this does here, Mike. <laughs> Any of those types of things. Be it just, so a lot of sort of the more pendulum dance-like activities are really, can be really good for fascia. Um, having fun and being bouncy. If you're, if you don't have, if you're not fully engaged with what you're doing and enjoying it, chances are you're just, you're, you're more likely to be binding up your fascia and getting too fixated. Um, now rest is very important. Fascia, um, any activity like with muscle growth, any activity you do stimulates fascial growth. But also like with muscle growth, any activity you're doing is also degrading the fascia. So there's sort of a rest after any activity you do gives, it, gives your fascia a chance to catch up. So you have these professional athletes who are training every day. They're not giving their fascia any chance to grow. They're growing their muscle really big. And then what tears? Their tendons and their ligaments and their fascia. So rest is important. Um, this is a curve after, after rigorous exercise. I couldn't figure out more than what they, me what they meant by rigorous exercise. But um, after 24 hours, you had there, this is how much your fascia has degraded over that period of time. After 24 hours, your fascia has been degraded quite a bit after the vigorous exercise. You've also been stimulating the um, new collagen fiber to be laid down. So it's a longer slope. So in the first 32 hours, you're actually, you, you have created a deficit to the actual collagen buildup in the fascia. Um, how strong your fascial system is. Past that point, you started to actually have some net fascial growth. Fascia change isn't, takes a while. Can be, if you were to be doing a lot of these types of exercises over the course of six months, you might start to really build up the fascia well. But it's, it's one of those, takes longer to, to build a good fascial network, but it also takes longer to degrade a good fascial network. Um, so after 30, so it's good after a vigorous exercise if you're thinking about fascial growth to rest for at least 32 hours. After 32 hours, you've gotten back to the same point you were to begin with. And if you stress it again, you might not get to that nice synthesis. So it's good to wait a little bit longer than the 32. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can read this well here. Everyone read the cartoon? Yep. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, 
I really like this cartoon because it, <laughs> I mean, it, well, a good Peanuts cartoon here. So the, the, de the, the depressed stance that Charlie Brown is expressing here, um, it's unclear which is cause and effect here. Did he have the depressed stance and become depressed, or did he feel depressed so he went into his depressed stance? For me, when I think of depression, I think of a literal depression in the chest. Um, the physiologically, you're depressed. And that, the more you stand like this, the more the actual hormones in your system are likely to make you feel depressed. Um, so opening up the tissue and having more full springy fascia through your rib cage um, will make you less likely to be depressed. Now, also, if you're emotionally depressed, you start to stand like this. So the fascia starts to get used to being here, and it starts to bind up. So I'm not getting into any cause and effect, whether, but in order to come out of depression, you need to, um, you need to be able to change the fascial structure in order to get out of it with ease, regardless of whether that's what put you into it to begin with. Um, that goes for many emotions, anxiety, and various feelings throughout the body. The way you feel affects the way you hold your body. And then the way you hold your body affects the way you feel. I'm going to talk briefly about um, the anatomy trains, which my instructor, Tom Myers, and pass this around too. It's the same anatomy trains. Um, I can take it over there if you prefer. <laughs> the, if you think of um, the early anatomists were butchers, literally. <laughs> they. Um, they're, they were thinking about, they were butchering animals and such, and they were thinking about the tenderness of meat. And they were removing all of this fascia, because that's grisly stuff that you don't really want to chew much on. That's, you, the, and they were thinking about where does muscle attach to bone. And they took everything except for muscle, where a muscle attached to bone, um, and pulled it away. So what you had left was, um, was a very clean, classic anatomy um, this muscle attaches from here to here. And when you engage this muscle, the knee straightens and the hip bends. The reality is you have a lot of other tissue that's continuing past, that's surrounding that muscle that's continuing past. So in this case, it's surrounding the knee and going down into the leg. Or let's talk about the superficial back line. You, you have the abenerosis of the cranium, the skull here, coming, which is all fascia, comes down the back of your neck and starts to go into your back muscles here. And like links of sausage, the individual muscles are all kind of tied up in there. But the casing, the sausage, continues down into the next muscle. So I'm going to do an exercise here. Does anyone here have a tight hamstrings? <laughs> OK, I'm going to have everyone stand up and go to touch their toes and tell me where you feel it, or as close to your toes as you can get. So where do you feel the strain? Where, what's keeping you from, from putting your full palms on the floor? I was going to say palming the floor, but it looks like we have some palming already. <laughs> So you can come up and tell me what you, where you felt the strain in your body. I didn't feel no. the strain. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kept you from putting your head on the floor, then? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> where, where, I'm not sure. where are you feeling, feel the strain? Uh, Everyone's is a little different. A little bit, and, in the lower back. OK, lower back for you. Mine was um, from my, my calves. My OK. Knees. Okay. Where are you feeling? Okay. A little further here. Okay. So sort of that hamstring attachment yeah. through here. So all of these areas for those of us who felt it. <laughs> well, let me. Yeah, I I'm feeling it towards my knees and up. So I'm feeling it in through here. Did you uh, bend your knees? I didn't, but okay. um, if you keep your knees straight, you're more actively engaging these muscles' relationship. If you bend them, it's not as engaged. But if you, so if everyone takes a tennis ball and takes off a shoe and 
does a... If you take the tennis ball and roll it on the bottom of your foot slowly, so that... If I can get my own shoe off. There we go. <laughs> um, so just a slow roll, putting a little bit of pressure. And I like a tennis ball because it gives. And sort of a, a very firm pressure and slowly trying to loosen up the plantar fascia. And if you do that with just one foot for a little while, I'll have you get back up and see if you feel a difference between your left and your right leg. And this doesn't always work for people, but, but sometimes you, just by releasing one part of this um, anatomy train, you'll have some slack coming all the way up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it seems related to that to that tendon in that line. It hurts a lot. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's, it's not a bone spur. I do know that. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure on that. It's hard to for me to tell without getting my hands on it. Yeah. Time for the, the moment, but. <laughs> yeah. So now, now leaning down and probably putting your shoe back on so that you have an even level, but I completely not in my shoe. Um, and then standing up and touching your toes again, and just noticing if you feel a difference between left and right foot, or left and right leg. And there's times when no one in the room does, but there's times you have people really feeling a difference. Feeling a little bit, Gail? A little bit, yeah. What, where do you, what do you feel? In that same area, it didn't seem to pull so much. It wasn't, yeah. it didn't sting as much. Okay, so that's so just the, giving, did you, me, you felt I, that? I can tell the difference. Yeah, so just by, just by working anywhere within one of these anatomy trains, you're, you're giving slack to everything else. I had a 90-year-old um, neighbor growing up, or growing up, I had this neighbor who's now in her 90s, and my mother called up and said she's experiencing real back pain, but we're not sure if there's um, fractured vertebrae or ribs or what's going on, do you have any suggestions? My mother's a massage therapist and was asking me what, what from a structural standpoint might be useful. I said, give her a tennis ball and have her rolled on the bottom of her foot. And she reported her back feeling better afterwards. Now, it could have just been because she felt like she could do something to make her, to feel like she had some control over the situation. Um, but just by giving some slack in one part of this line, you're giving some slack mm -hmm. all the way up. Um, there's a lot of different lines in the body. I'll just, I'll just hold a few up instead of passing them. That's actually, that's a more complex one. There's a line running up the side of the body. Um, these lines are more functional, so they're, they're not holding your posture as much, but they're lines of tissue. Now, a lot of these are overlapping. It's just different tracks that you could, that you could take from that are linked together. And then you have the front line. And in, the, in Tom Meyer's description of anatomy trains, he refers to this as a derailment. There's a mechanical connection between this line and this line, but there's no actual fascial connection. So just, and then there's four different lines in each arm. So, and there's infinite more connections and lines. These are just <coughs> main ones that travel a long distance. And carpal tunnel. So now that you have a little bit of an understanding of fascia, we can have a better understanding of what carpal tunnel is. Everyone has a carpal tunnel. They have two of them, if they have two hands. Um, the carpal tunnel is made up of the bones, um, the palm bones that make a little bit of an arc right here. And then the fascial sheet, um, which here they're referring to as ligament. I sometimes have seen referred to as parmal, parmal aponeurosis, but that just shows that they change their definition sometimes too. So this sheet of fascia that's holding together um, and making, making the roof of this tunnel. Now running through this tunnel is two tendons for these four fingers and one tendon for the thumb. And 
a large nerve and an artery that they're not showing. And they have these tendon sheaths for each one of those tendons to keep them from rubbing into each other. So you've got a lot of things packed into a very little space. So as you're doing some activity that's bringing your hands close together, typing at computers is a common one, using a mouse is a common one, um, or any sort of repetitive crochet work, or anything you're doing with your hands, you start to, you can start to narrow that by just laying, the body saying, oh, this is what you want us to do, and starts to lay down more and more material here and tighten it up. So often carpal tunnel is one of the most avo avoidable surgeries, and this isn't just, this is from talking to um, physical therapists who have, who have just graduated um, school, so it's sort of the very, it's not from their own experience, it's sort of the textbook um, that, and it's my experience, it's very avoidable too, that 90% <laughs> of surgeries, if people would just do the exercises that PT told them, um, they wouldn't need the surgery. So the work that I am going to be suggesting, I think, is potentially better than the exercises. I don't really know the PT exercise as well. The PT exercises, I think, tend to be yeah. stretches for opening up the carpal tunnel, maybe holding back the wrist like this, and really thinking about different ways to get a stretch in the palm. Um, the work I'm going to have you do is if you place the back of your hand down on the table, and you can use a knuckle, or if that's sore, you can use your elbow. And just without, move, without doing any real movement, just sink down into that space. And don't necessarily try to move anything. The center of your palm? Or yeah, or the base of your palm. So you're aiming base. right for this. So right there. I've never actually had a couple of tunnel, but in the last few years when I'm riding my bike, my hands start to get numb. Fingers. So which fingers? Oh, gosh, you know, I never even thought about it. Because this nerve that's running through it, and this is sort of the often used in diagnosis of whether or not someone's got carpal tunnel or it's another type of nerve impingement. It's not, it's not true all the time, so I'm not a doctor. I can't be saying this is the case, and it isn't always. But if you impinge this nerve that's in the, um, that's in the carpal tunnel, it's feeding the thumb these two fingers and half of this finger. So often people go, oh, my whole hand is numb. But when, when they stop to think about it, their pinky and this side of this finger are actually not feeling numb or pain. So that tends to be a sign of carpal tunnel. If you're feeling numbness in your pinky, it's more likely to be a restriction further up the arm in the um, brachial plexus further up. It's still possible it's a restriction here if it's here. Because this is all connected. If you release this part of your arm, you might be able to release the tissue in your carpal tunnel. If you release your shoulder, you might be able to release the tissue in your carpal tunnel because it's all that one connected fascial network. Yeah, well, it's the fact that you're in that position. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, do I have to get a bike so I sit straight up now? Yeah, and that might, that might be useful, and it might be just doing some rich, wrist stretches afterwards of different types, and I'd be happy to show you a few if you want later. I won't, I won't necessarily. Um, get into those now, but if we have time, I can show you a few other wrist stretches. But just by leaning into that area, and a lot of the work I do is very slow, and I could be waiting somewhere for, um, one of my teachers refers to it as parking. <laughs> just sort of waiting there, waiting for things to shift and open up. And you can wiggle your fingers a little bit, slowly, and just that helps the tendons moving through, and just clears that up a little bit. So that's something you can do on your own. A lot of this fast stuff is might feel good and might do some work, but I think the real slow um, work, and you could take a tennis ball and push the tennis ball against the table. Um, while we're at tennis balls, I have everyone's got two tennis balls and a sock, which you're welcome to take home. I think this is one of the best self-care tools there is. Um, I really hate those big wooden ball, those wooden balls that don't give. Yeah. Um, there's some people who think that there's particular squash balls or particular balls that have a different density that they prefer, and I can see their reasons, but I think this is a lot less expensive. <laughs> um, you put two in a sock, you've got a little space in between, or don't purposely make space, but just by them being together, you've got some space there. It's a good place to put right on either side of your spine, 
and you can lay down on it, and you can slowly roll your body up and down on the tennis balls. And, it's, you can, and very slowly, like we were talking about with the hand stuff, you can just, you can release your own spine a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you can use a tennis ball for the bottom of your feet, you can use, <laughs> you can use it for your back, um, sort of laying on the floor with your knees bent, you get to control where it is that way. I guess you can work in the chair too. I'm guessing you won't get quite the right thing. I drive a lot. Mm-hmm. Work. All, all day. Mm-hmm. I think you could lean up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you have a little more control. I wouldn't lean on that because there's marker board. That's no, there's that there. <laughs> very complex totals for the co-op. <laughs> Whatever is oh, going on there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so it's a useful tool there. Don't fall asleep on it. I've heard. Oh. One of my teachers once told me <laughs> that if you go, oh, that's a really great spot and fall asleep, I've heard that people were in more pain when they woke up. None of my clients have ever had that happen. <laughs> uh, but yes, they give enough that I like it a lot more than those, the two wooden balls next to each other. That they, so if you're lying down, you just kind of roll your body over? Yeah, you can roll your body over. So that's why if you have your knees bent, you're sort of pushing with the bottom of your feet. You can roll your body over and have it be slow. And if you don't feel like pushing yourself up and down on it, you can just reposition it each time. And, and that way, you could even think between on either side of every vertebrae. You could go up until you find a spot that you're like, ooh, that's really tight. Let's play with that a little longer. Yeah. And spend at least 30 seconds on each one. Don't really just be rolling through, because that's, that'll help with the circulation if you go quickly. But it won't necessarily help with the fossil change. What do we have next? Yep. Uh, with the carpal tunnel, if, if um, someone has already had the surgery and the carpal tunnel has been severed, mm -hmm. um, does that exercise that you just told us that doesn't do any good, right? It could still help. I'm, I haven't heard of many. Rec the, the surgeries tend to be pretty effective. Um, but at the same time, anytime you cut into something, you tend to make scar tissue for the healing. So I've been curious, and I really don't know the answer to this, how often you have somebody get carpal tunnel surgery and the surgeon did enough, a type of an incision that makes scar tissue build up and you have the same problem again. Now, sometimes they'll go in there and they'll actually create more space in the bones and do more um, involved stuff. But usually, they're just making a slit in that and trying to widen the carpal tunnel. So it could still be helpful in preventing helping that scar tissue. Um, and so the exercise that. is basically only if you feel numbness. It's, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a bad idea to do preventatively, but there's so many other things people have to do with their lives that you don't necessarily need to be doing preventative <laughs> um, carpal tunnel work. But that's a sense of like the type of pressure that you do. And you could do the same thing with your forearms, and that would actually help the carpal tunnel and just sort of be feeding the tissue to your hand. And the work I do, I would be taking all the way from the chest and thinking out to it. Um, this last, this is a little three minute video about, and I'm only about an hour in, and I, I, can, talk, I can talk in more detail in just about any direction you guys would like. Um, but I'll just show you a, a quick video here um, about the work I do, the structural integration work. The work I do is called structural integration. For many people, they find it to help with the constant struggle against gravity. Um, we're always at computers, driving cars, or shoveling snow, and these things just really create a lot of strains on our posture. Over time, we start to slip into these postures um, more permanently, and it starts to feel painful and really difficult to come back into an upright posture and feel comfortable that way for more than a couple of minutes. Instead of focusing on muscles and the work I do, I really think about the fascia, which permeates the whole structure. Um, any restriction in one area pulls on the rest of the structure. And I, in each session, I want to just keep thinking about how to open up and relieve the tensions in the body. One of the most common complaints I hear is pain right between the, the shoulder blades and that upper back. And people often want me to work there. Um, and this isn't surprising considering that um, most of these people are bent over. The restriction isn't coming from the upper back. 
the culprit is actually the um, superficial front line, which runs from the top of the feet, uh, across the thighs, and up our abdomen. That is restricted, pulling our shoulders forward and causing an overstretching of the muscles that, um, that are just doing the best they can to hold us upright. So by working up the superficial front line, we begin to release the, um, the restrictions that are holding us forward. This opens up our breath and allows, allows us to have the chance to start to settle onto our back again. That's the first step in this work. We still need to um, get our neck used to being in the new position. And rolling forward our pelvis oriented to support our back and take some of the bends and rotations out of the back. This is done over the, the full series of 12 sessions. Each session works on a different set of tensions. Feet, the knees, the pelvis, the entirety of the spine, shoulders, and our head and neck. These sessions are interactive. I often ask clients to do specific movements while I work so they can fully integrate the changes to their structure. When I first received the work, I was surprised at how much the work not only helped me physically but psychologically. I became much more clear in what I wanted to do with my life and I'm really proud to have received this training and be able to offer it to the wider community.